Hi oh guys, welcome back to the workshop. Today we're going to be building a traditional panelled door. This is the plans. I'll pop you up a version on the screen for you to have a look at now. This is a door to match some existing doors in the customer's property. So you can see some of the sizes are quite uh, quite unique there. The panel in the middle is, is certainly very unique to this property. I've not made a door like this before. The construction of this door is exactly the same whether you're doing a traditional four panel, six panel or something like this. So if you're looking to build a panel door from solid timber using traditional methods and joints, then this is the video for you. So I'm going to use some X two inch timber. So an X timber is the sawn, square sawn size. So X two inch is two inches thick in its sawn state. So if somebody details X two inch as a finish, then that could be anything from that two inch um, original size, whatever it planes down to, which is normally about 44 or 45 mil. Now, because I'm working with a 18 mil plywood panel and I want about a 12 mil step on the uh, sides of the panel there to the door each side, we're going to be looking at a door finish thickness of, I think it's around 42 mil thick. That's our sort of finished plane thickness. I know that's not a standard thickness of any door by any stretch of the imagination, but we're looking for something just a tiny bit beefier in this case than the existing doors, which are, I think, 32 or uh, 35 mil thick. Um, the reason we want the heavier doors is because this is having a big spice rack put on the back of the door to be part of the pantry. So it's going to be quite a lot of weight on there. So I'm going to add a bit of thickness and strength to that door by beefing it up a little bit. So let's go grab the timber and make a start at building this door. So before we start cutting any timber up, we need to make a cutting list. So we can see the dimensions of the door here. It's two foot six by six foot six door lining that we're working from. So main pieces, 1981, mil long. So I'd have at least 20 mil onto that for handling and uh, cutting square purposes. So you want at least two pieces that are two meters long. Now the width of this piece of timber here is 120 mil. So we want 52 by 120. So we've got X two inch and then we've got a 120 is our finished size. So we're looking to cut something around 125, 130. So if we change that to 125, that's the rough sawn size. And then we want two at two meters. And then we want one at the full width of the door for this rail here, which is 766. So if we do that 790, that gives us our top rail. And then we're looking at these intermediate rails, the bottom rails, and then these two rails here. Now these two have a special name in a door. In a window it would be a mullion, but within a door, a vertical rail in the centre like that is called a muntin, M-U-N-T-I-N. So these are 108 millimetres, so our X52 by, let's say about 112, we're going to need two of them at the full width of the door. So we'd say two at 790. Then we're going to need one of them there at 255 plus whatever tenon we're going to put on the end of it. So I'm going to add at least 60 mil onto the end of this piece of timber for the rough sawn size each end. We're going to add 120 mil onto that 255. That leaves us with uh, 375. A one at 375, and we've got 853. So, again, add that 60 mil tenon on to each end of that. So, we're going to add uh, 973. And then, finally, bottom rail, we want a piece 52 by 223 to get that 217 out, or 222. And then, we want uh, one of them, and that's going to be. 790 millimeters. So that's our cutting list. Depending on what timber we've got, we might have to joint a bit up to make up this wide bottom rail here. 
but I think I've got a bit of timber that will do it. The key with cutting the timber up from the raw material is to make sure your long lengths and your wide lengths are accessible at the timber before you start cutting any of these smaller or shorter lengths, it's like narrower widths or shorter lengths. You don't want to cut a load of them out and then realise you've not got enough left for your styles. And equally, if your material in the middle is uh, similar width to your styles, you can always plane up three lengths of style and then choose to cut one of the styles up to make these width pieces up or shorter pieces up if it takes a, a slight bend or something after it comes off the planer gives you that uh, option to choose your material to make your styles from. So this is the wood I'm going to be using it's called tulip wood or poplar if you're American. Um, it's a fairly stable quite durable timber in terms of um, density it's quite uh, strong timber. It's got a very fine grain so it's great for painted applications. It's not so good for staining. You, you can stain it dark colours and it look quite nice, but you've got to be a bit select as to what pieces of timber you use, because some of them can have quite a dark purple stain or grain marks in them, and some bits can be really white and even grey. So it's quite a good variation on the grain. Um, so if you are using it for staining, you've got to be a bit careful, but it's the perfect timber for painting, it leaves a lovely finish. So we're just looking for some nice straight bits. I've got a few bits of wood to choose from. But we're looking for a couple of straight bits to make our styles from. The straighter it is out the packet, so off the sawmill that you bring into your workshop, the more likely it is to be straight when it comes off the planer and remain straight once it's been installed. Now we've got some plain timber to our finished sizes. I've gone with 44 mil thick for these doors. I've decided that's uh, the best thickness of the doors that were there. There's a good variation between 38 and about 48 mil. So I'm going to go with an 18 mil panel thickness, and I think I'm going to offset it very slightly in the door. So one side's got a narrower panel ledge so it'd be about 13mm uh, from the face to the 18mm panel then it'd be 18mm panel and the back edge of the door will have a slightly deeper gap to that panel. So that's what I'm going to do and then I've got the option when I fit it as to whether I have a narrower panel ledge or panel depth or a deeper one depending on which door it's near once they have all been fitted. So you don't have to worry about that too much. It also helps with this video because 44mm is quite a standard internal door thickness or external door thickness if you find something off the shelf. It's a, it's a fairly standard thickness because it is X2 inch. It's roughly the sort of thickness you'll be looking to achieve when you start with 2 inch timber. So we're just going to grab the styles here and have a quick look at them as always when we're making the door. So we're looking down the length of the style and we're looking for a bow in any direction. We're also going to look for twists. We don't want any twist in the style. An easy way to check for twist is to lay the board flat like this on the bench and then get some winding sticks. So a winding stick isn't anything special but it's just two, two pieces of wood that you lay across the surface of the board you're checking at each end or wherever you want to check that board like so, making sure that they are perpendicular to the piece of wood. Then you just lower your vision against them two pieces and you check the 
wind on them bits of wood. So here we go, we've set the tripod up. Hopefully you can see as I lower it down, I'm looking for this edge here where it's where the edge of the timber finishes. We're looking against the bottom edge of that panel there. It helps in this situation because we've got that nice dark background to look against. But we're looking for them or that gap between the two to be perfectly parallel. We just wind that in very slowly. I can't really see what's happening on the screen. So I'll just dip back and forth against the two. But that's pretty good. That's nice and nice and straight. So that's called a winding stick and that will check to see if that piece of timber is twisted. You're gonna need a set of winding sticks if you're gonna be planing door styles or anything up by hand and you're flattening off this surface here with a hand plane, you're gonna be using your winding stick quite a lot to make sure that piece of timber is nice and flat. So once you've checked it for squareness and flatness, if you've got a slight bow in your piece of wood, and I always like to orientate it so that the spring in the bow, so the top and the bottom of the door, um, will always touch the door stops first. So if you can't get away with putting that piece of timber with the hinges, so the hinges will hold it straight, if you've got it on the latch side, have the bow so that when you pull the latch in, the top and bottom of the door touch first, and then your latch has a tiny bit of spring and can try and hold that door nice and straight. If you do it the other way around, so that the spring is outwards and the top and the bottom of the door are away from the frame, when you pull your latch in, it's just going to lead to it bending even more away from that latch. So, that's our door styles. These are, are pretty good if you put them together, like so. We've got about a half a mil gap there, and if we turn it around, pretty much exactly the same. So I say one of these has got that style, has got a half a mil bend in this direction. So it's basically nothing. So it's not too much to worry about whatsoever. So I'm gonna put that as my face. Choose a nice side for my other face, that one there and they will sit like this in the door. If you're wondering what a face mark is, I'm sure you'll know by now if you've watched any of the other setting out videos. So I've done a, a squiggly line, I'll draw it again down here for you, like this. That's a face mark and it goes on the, what we call the face of the timber. So if you're looking at this door here, the face is the piece that you see. So if I draw that mark on this style here, which it is, it will look like this here. So the squiggly line is the face, and then the, the tail leads off to the inside edge. So this edge here of that piece of timber is the inside edge. And then we signify the inside edge of the piece of timber with a little V mark like this. And when we've got a V mark like that, if we put the two faces together, it should make up an X. So generally you'd do that with your two door styles and that would signify a pair of door styles. You've got to be really careful when you are setting out any form of joinery, doors, windows, casements, anything like that, that you keep everything in pairs. Faces, two edge marks. And that just gives us a good reference. I know if I pick that piece of timber up randomly, if there's 20 doors and I just pick this piece up, I know exactly what is going on each corner of that piece of timber. If I'm molding something on this edge and a rebate on this edge, I know exactly what it's going to be just by looking at these marks here. So Dictate a top now, so this end of the door is going to be the top. I'm just going to put a T on the top end there. 
So we can clamp them two together now. One's a lot longer than the other just because the timber left me with a nice bit of length on one piece and one piece I cut tight to get an extra bit off the end. All right, so clamp them together. And we can use our drawing here that we're working from. And we're just setting out these, these rails now to make the joints between that rail and that style. So we're going from the top of the door. I'm going to mark this overall dimension and then work in from that using these dimensions to set it out. I'll tell you what has caught me out recently, I thought it probably worth mentioning while, I, while it's fresh in my brain. I dropped my tape measure on the floor, didn't think anything of it, picked it up, carried on marking out um, some cabinets that I was making. What I didn't realise was it had landed on the metal bit of the end of the tape, just here, and it landed on the floor on that point there and actually bent it inwards and it bent the one corner of the tape so most of it looked all right but one corner of it was bent inwards and it was measuring about about three mil less than it should have read on the tape because that bend on the end there was kinked in three mil so it's worthwhile constantly checking that you've not done something similar with your tape measure. Right, so we're not going to work off the end of the tape, we're going to work to 1981. We've got a 2 metres and 35 door, so I'm going to work from 25 mil. So I've hooked the end of the tape over, I'm just going to tick 25 mil here. That's going to be the bottom of the door. Now if we go to the other end, at this end of the tape, with that hooked on the end, we're marking 1981 plus that 25mm, so 10, 25, so it's 2 metres and 6 millimetres. I always double check these external measurements because this is the point at which you go wrong. If you're measuring off 100mm, 25mm, whatever a mill it will be, always stick your tape back on at that point, so we want 1981 finish. I'll just roughly check that the other end of the tape is on our tick mark where we want it to be. You know, I wouldn't mark it off that setting because it's inaccurate using the end of the tape as a tick point, but it's a good reference to go back and check to make sure you're not making a door that's 100mm too short. The reason you do it 100mm too short is it's quite common to measure from on your tick lines that 100 mil mark on your tape and then allow for it at the other end because it's really accurate to line it up but that's where you go wrong is when you forget to add that back on and it is a really common mistake so be careful with that one all right so this is the top of our door we've got a 120 mil rail so using that 100 mil technique 120 we're going to have a Tick. Mark in there. Then we can square that over. A rusty old square out. It's about time I bought a new one. So on the lookout for something nice. If anybody's got a suggestion of a nice square, hit me up. So that's the top rail position. If you grab it, you can see where that's going to go in. I've actually made the top rail slightly oversized in the thickness of, and it's going to give me a bit of room to cut that down afterwards but that's the finished size and that's the finished dimension that we're working to. So we're going to break this tenon up now into the tenon and then the wedge room or where the haunch will be. So because we've got a panel in this door we're going to need to use a setback because the panel is going to be in line with where the mortise was going to go. So, from the face, we've got, what have we got left? 44, 18, 34, 20, 26, that's 13 mil each side. So, let's just do it in the middle, 13 mil. It's not going to look too much, is it? Right, so if I go from my face, 12mm. 12 12mm. 12 
Then I've got an 18mm panel. So this isn't a very accurate set out for you. Just trying to show you. Just there and just there. I'm going to set that groove 10mm deep. So 10mm deep. I'm just going to square that line over. Let me grab a bit of panel. Right, so this is the visible edge of our door here. And that will be where the panel groove will finish. So the panel will have about a 2mm gap in the panel groove. And it will look something like that as a finished door. So because the tenon is going to be in this part here, we're going to need to set that back the depth of this groove that the panel is going to sit in. So from our 120mm setback there, we're going to do a 10mm setback. So that leaves us with 110mm in the for the mortise and the haunch. So I'm going to look to do a 50mm tenon. And that should leave me with a nice 60mm haunch room. Square that over. So this section here is my tenon. I'm writing upside down here. How about that for skills? And that is my haunch room. And that is the setback, which weighs an S. Is it the same? Yeah, it's the same. <laughs> so we do the same thing for all the joints in the door. They're all slightly different because of the makeup and the position in the door. So the bottom rail. This is the extreme of our door, so this is the very bottom of the door. According to our drawing, we've got a 217mm rail. So 317 working off 100mm. We've got a 10mm setback, so that's 307. The setback, unless you check doing two different cuts, like a rebate and a groove, or you're changing something, the setback is always the same. Wherever you're grooving that door will be exactly the same setback. That's our setback position here. And then we are left with 207mm. I'm going to go for 45mm tenon. I'm going to give it 55 between them. And we go 45 again. That leaves me with just over 60 mil, so 62 mil. The reason I'm having a bit bigger gap between them is because by the time you've got uh, the wedge room in the back side of the door, it doesn't leave an awful lot of timber between them two tenons. So just opening that gap up will give you a bit of a, a more even tenon gap on the back of the door. Boards in the way. Not the first time I've said that. Oh, I. So, again, a bit of skillful upside down writing coming up. Set back, and then that is our tenon. That's a haunch, tenon, haunch. And that's the bottom rail joint. Now the advantage of having the door all drawn out for you is that you can just measure away without too much hassle. So we've got 853 to the next rail. So we're working from that 100mm. You'd forgotten already, haven't you? 953. You were going to mark it on 853, I can tell. We've got 108 mil rail. So, like everything, starting with the positioning and then we're breaking the joint down once we've got it in position. Now, with this type of rail, you could either reduce the tenon down to something a bit smaller 
But by the time you've got two setbacks in there, what are we left with? That would be 98, 88 mil. Um, it's probably a tiny bit too big, isn't it? 88 mil. Is that too big for a tenon? It's taking quite a lot out the door. Wonder if I should uh, should reduce that down very slightly. Put a stub in that one. Throw in that one. Alright, so this first tenon, I'm going to do a through tenon without reducing it. So I'm going to go 10 mil setbacks either way. And I'll through mortise that throughout the whole width of that tenon. And being 88 mil, that is quite a lot. It's a tiny bit more than ideally you'd like on a single tenon because the tenon can have a tendency to crush too much and not make too tight of a joint. But I think it's acceptable for this particular application in the middle of a door, it's going to be fine. But because it's got two very close to each other here, so that's the one we've just drawn, and we've got this one here. I'm just going to do a stub tenon in this one, something to locate that rail into the style and apply a bit of glue to, but not something that's going to go right through the door style and take too much strength out of this section here. So our measurement for that is 255 from that second one there. We'll just check that from the top at 320. Yeah. And we'll check that leaves us with 108, which it does perfectly. It's nice when it works out. So we want a 10mm set back there. 10 mil there. And we'll draw that on. So if I just draw stub on that, so I'm going to do that upside down for the camera. Look at this for mad skills. Did that read right. Oh. So that reminds me that when I'm doing the mortising, I don't go right the way through with that tenon. And that's the all the joints and the styles set out. So all we've got to do then is square over all the lines that carry a through tenon. So on the top rail, it's that internal one. And we're squaring that all the way to the back. On the bottom rail, the detail should look like that. So tenons squared over the face of the piece of timber. And on the back edge, we've squared them tenons again. And then we've drawn a little wedge room on there as well. Wedge room, you can draw it on slightly narrower on the top side of the wedge because that will be sat hard up against the stops in the mortise. So the setback or groove will push right up square to this edge and there'll be a bit of wiggle room in your joint to get your joint together and that's going to create a a bigger wedge at the back here so sorry i've told you wrong you want a, a bigger wedge room on this bit here and this bit here than you do here and here because these two will equate for the wiggle room of getting the joint together now we're going to move on to the rails, cut them off to length and then we can set the joints out on the rails as well. Now they're cut to length, I can put the face marks on the rails. So the top rail just has a single face mark and an edge mark, exactly as the door styles, because only one edge of the door is going to be worked on with that groove. This 
is one of the intermediate rails. So we're going to call it this one here, this rail running across here. So it's got a face mark on both sides because we're having a groove both on this edge here and this edge here. There will be a groove for that panel. So if I pick that piece of timber up, I know that I need to machine both sides. And then one side of it is going to have a mortise in it right in the centre of the door for this piece of timber called a muntin that's going to be mortised into it. So we're going to dedicate one side to be in the top of the piece of timber. So this bottom edge is going to have the muntin mortised into it. I'm just going to find the centre. So that's 350. 383, 383, 383, yeah. Then add on that rail from both edges, so it's 108, which is 54 mil. I'm just going to check that from both ends. Yep, yeah. then adding our setback for our mortise. So ten. We can square those lines up, it might help us when we're gluing up. So that we can visually see that this muntin is about in the right place. But the most important line to square over is these two mortise lines, like so, and that's going to be a stub mortise. It's really easy to write upside down, I'm finding it quite good, quite good fun. That's that rail. This one's pretty much going to be a mirror image, apart from the fact there is a mortise in both sides. Now what you can do here is some fancy joint in there that will actually lock these two rails together. But uh, I generally tend to stub them so that they're kept apart or mortise it right through and just do it so there's about half a mil gap between the two joints when it's pushed together nice and tight. It's up to you which method you choose to do. I like to keep a stub with a bit of timber left on this rail just because when you're gluing up if it's a hollow joint all the way through this piece of timber when you glue it up and you push your first piece in all it does is shove all the glue to one side of the joint and then when you push your next one in it just goes everywhere whereas if you've got two stub joints the glue tends to keep captive as you push each joint together individually so we'll just set that one out exactly the same as the other piece. So this is going to be our face. We've got two machined edges. Then we can use the other piece of timber. Centre it up with that one. Mark our four lines on. We can square them over. So that's our guideline for the outside of the timber. That's our mortise position. And then square them across so that we know where to mortise. Oh, do it upside down. That's your homework, learn to write upside down. And finally, bottom rail. These are always difficult to mortise, so you end up adjusting the mortiser to try and physically fit them in. I would always gauge them before you mortise because a rail of, of this height sat in a bed that's clamped at the bottom here. If there's any bend in the rail, your mortise position is going to differ in the door. So I'd use your mortise gauge to check that your mortiser is positioned exactly as it is for the rails and styles. But on that top inside edge, 
we'll use the first one that we marked always to reference these lines from. You don't want to mark one from this one and then use the next one to mark your next one because then you can get a accumulation of errors with it. So we're always marking off the same piece and then the in inaccuracy only lies across one set of markings. Square them lines over, we've got a visual reference for our glue up, and then we've got two lines to mortise to. Oh, yes, and that's the setting out, all done. We've got one thing left to do before we jump onto the tenoner. And that is just to cut the lengths of these Muntin rails. So this is our rail. I said I'd add 60 mil each end for a tenon for when I got my timber out. So it's 853. I've got it out at a metre, just under a metre. So it's given me plenty of room to set a tenon on there. We can always cut the tenon off to length once it's been sheened. But what we need to establish here is this length between these two rails. So up to this inside edge, that's our shoulder point. And then we're gonna have to decide how much tenon we're gonna add on the top of that. So if we cut this piece of timber off at that gap between the two, which is 853, and then we cut it off plus 120 mil, plus 120 should leave us with uh, 973. Let's have a look, see if my other piece will do that same. Yes it will, because it's quite a long bit. So if we work with a 60 mil tenon, so I've added 60 mil on each end of that piece of timber to cut a tenon. When we're doing our tenoning, we'll have to alter it after we've done the rails to change the length of tenon from 120 mil, which we'll do for the width of the styles, down to 60 mil, so that we can cut these two. And as we alter that, we just want to check that everything is going to line up nicely. So we just sit this piece of timber on the door styles and check that the shoulders line up with them nice crisp pencil lines of that joint. Right, so we're on to the tenoner now to put the tenon on the door rails first. So. Setting this up from scratch, I got a sacrificial piece out the same thickness of the door, so 44 mil, and I'm gonna screw this onto the fence, this backing fence here, so that that creates a perfect shear cut image of the joint we're gonna make, so that when I put a rail in and cut the rail against that end grain that's running this way, this piece of timber holds the grain nice and tightly and stops it from tearing out. So we're just going to push this through onto the tenon blocks. If you look at this position here, they're going to be nice and flush with each other. So as long as they pass, the, the sacrificial fence passes that point there where the blocks protrude to, it will work for what we need it to. I'm just attaching that through the fence with a couple of screws. Now that we've got them tenons nicely in place, we can set the mortiser up from them. It's a nice easy way around of doing it. 
because the tenon is easy to set up because you just put it where you want it. You've not got to worry too much about position against a mortise. You've just got to worry about the thickness of the tenon to make sure that matches the chisel. And then adjust your mortiser for position. So that's the only thing you've got to worry about on the mortiser is exactly where the position's going. If you do your mortise first, there's nothing really to set on the for the in terms of the joint on the mortiser, you just put it in a position and mortise away, and then you end up doing everything on the tenoner from thickness of tenon, position of tenon, and shoulder depth. And it can take you quite a while of back and forth adjustment of settings to get it set up correctly. So you're much better off doing your tenoning first, then altering the position of the mortise to suit where the tenon is. So let's line that up. I'll just run it through on a test piece. You always put your face against the machine bed. So tenon a mortise. Set some stops up. We need a through depth. So it's a 120, so we need at least 60. So I've got 55 on as a through depth. And a haunch of 80. So on this machine we set the haunch depth first. It's just the way the stop mechanism is. Set that there, and then we we'll set three mortise steps, which looks pretty good on that setting. So now let's check the tenon position. Just stab one small hole, doesn't have to go right full depth, just enough to get it 10 mil deep set into the timber. Make sure you mark the face on the test piece. Then we could just overlay one of the tenon joints so it's flush with that piece of timber and we put that right up against the shoulder there where the, the shoulder meets the tenon so that's our test hole here and we can just eyeball either side of that joint and make sure it's in line with the tenon you shouldn't really be able to see the mortise once that everything is flushed up it should just be perfectly in line with it. So on this example here, we've got a slight gap on this back edge. I don't know if you can see that on the screen. Slight gap here. So we're just gonna have to move that chisel a fraction in towards the fence. So clamp a piece of timber back in. And on this machine, you just bed is on the main wheel. You just pull it back towards you and engage it in the gears. And then I've written on here, look, the bed away from this point here. So that's the movement we want to do. So if we just turn the handle this way, not even an eighth of a turn, it's a minute amount of movement we need to do. Then we can do another test. Bench, flush that up again. So we've got a pretty perfect joint right there. With very little effort in setting that up, we should have a very, very good joint. So we'll just more to send pretty quick. Anywhere that says stub, we'll just use that haunch depth setting rather than going through to full depth. Right, so the styles and the face against the fence. I'm going to start on that back edge where the wedges are going to go. It just helps when you get a narrow set of styles that you don't destroy the corner of the wedge room when you come through against the haunch room. You're always going to go in on that inside edge where the rail is going to butt up to it and that will keep it cut nice and square.
this side we're going to cut the tenon through at that same through setting and then we're going to cut the haunch and the horn setting. So you can see that's gone through the piece of timber and out through into the other cut. So it goes through about there and you just want a bit of extra room for that to be clear. And for the horn, you're just that position and that will stop the chisel at the horn step. So I apologise if this video isn't perfectly seamless. I mortised these a couple of weeks ago and they've sat in the workshop since. So I'm just going to do a couple of hours on this door and try and progress it a bit further. I'm super busy at the minute and I'm just trying to do bits as and when I can. And I've not had a chance to watch what I've filmed back over and pick it up seamlessly where I left off. So if there is a bit of a jump or I cover something twice, so I apologise for that. So we are just finished mortising the styles. Looks like I've still got the mortises still to do on the rails, so I'll just pop a stub mortise in them rails where I've written stub on. It's handy when you've marked out and uh, done nice bits of writing and notes on it because if you do pick a job up like this halfway through, you know what you've got to do still. So top rail and intermediate rails um, only the mortises or wherever there is an appropriate mortise I'm just going to pop them in the rails now. I'm not sure if I mentioned it before but on the bottom rail here I'll show you the mortising process for this one but because it's quite a tall rail um, the height of the fence that you're clamping this rail against is only about half the height of the actual piece of timber. So there is a chance for the, the bit that you want the mortise to locate accurately into at this point here, that that could move front or back against where the actual fence position is. So it's a good idea to use a mortise gauge set to the mortise that you've done in everything else and then just run it along any mortises that you're putting in, any tall rails, and then you can just make a small adjustment to make sure that they're gonna line up to them lines, but I'd always do them last. So once you've done all the other rails, don't move your settings for them. And then when everything's done, um, you can mess about with doing these rails after the fact, so you're not altering your mortise setup for any of the other rails that are set at the same height that you've done already. So you want a mortise gauge. Now there's better ones of these and worse. What you're looking for in a good mortise gauge is fine pins that are nice and long. You don't want them too short because they end up uh, being hard to see what you're doing and not marking the timber properly. You get too sharp a point, it makes a bigger line. So the finer the point on the tip of the pin, the better. And I prefer the style of mortise gauge that has a threaded collar on the end. So you can set your mortise width using this threaded collar. So by turning this thumb screw here, adjust the width between the two pins, and that, and that is set. So you've not got to worry about that while you're adjusting 
the width from the face. Whereas with this style, God, that's not good. Just drop it, it's fine. This style of gauge, you, once you've undone this thumb screw, you can move both the width of the gauge and the position. And it can get a bit fiddly and frustrating trying to get that perfect setup. It does work, but they're a bit cheaper, but you're much better off with something like this. So we just want them points to be perfectly the width of the mortise and then we'll just clamp that in position. We can just check this out the end of the styles. Working from the face, which I've not done. Should be in the middle for this door, but it's bad practice. We're a little bit off there, we just want a tiny push more. I think we're about there. So we've set that gauge up, true to our current mortises. Then we just take the the wide rail, so in this case, the bottom rail. We'll run that line through, referencing from the face again. And we're not looking to go past this line. We've got 10 mil of setback to hide any overspin of the gauge lines, but it's good practice to keep within them lines. It's not particularly good practice to run a pencil in the grooves for the purposes of the camera. I'll run one in. Uh, thicken the groove you're looking to work to the very point of that groove rather than a thick pencil line so you can actually pick out the center between the two edges on that pencil and we want to mortise that as accurately as we can on the machine you're gonna have to lift the head of the mortiser up again that's another point where there could be an inaccuracy as we slide this head up on the um, face plate here it could sit slightly differently on it and cause another inaccuracy in the positioning so it's another reason why we want to have that gauge line there just to check take your best guess at the height Never quite get it right. And a couple of inches more. Could all do with that. Go. Pop that bad boy in. Clamp her up. It's worthwhile doing that because we're about, I bet we're a good millimetre out of alignment there. So, there you go. Worthwhile spending the time setting that up. I well, usually once I've set or adjusted the machine, just give it a give it a bit of movement left and right to find where it's going to seat as you're working and then just recheck it make sure it's pretty good way. Let's go there perfect and then we mortise that through as a stub tenon I'm going to go quite deep so I don't have to cut this one off So that's the mortises and tenons done. In 
from them haunch positions, we're just going to clean up the chaff that's left in the corners. Unless you want really finessed haunches and perfect tenons meeting them haunches. For a door, on the top of a door you're not going to see. The best method really is just to mash your chisel down flush with the tenon and just get rid of that material that the tenon leaves behind. Just as long as that haunch is nice and flat bottom so we can reference off it to get a cut measurement to cut that haunch height off, that's all you need to do. So now I'm going to run the groove in for the panels. I've got a couple of sheets of the panel material. I thought these sheets just ended the job and the veneers weren't quite up to the task what I wanted so I'm just going to try and use up the bits that I ended up cutting up and not being able to return in projects like this door. So I've just got a couple of the sheets or off cuts. I'm going to check it in several places with a vernier caliper and get a well, max thickness of the panel product, 17.4, 17.6. They are going to vary quite a lot, plywood, and MDF is usually pretty accurate, but plywood can have quite a variation in it, so it's worth checking with a measurement and a test fit that things are going to go together. So I work on 17.6, should be about right. Check this one, different piece of wood. So that's 177, 178, 178. So let's aim for 17, 17.8 on the adjustable groover and I'll groove all of those rails in and styles. Remember we're grooving everywhere that we have got one of these edge marks. So when we had a face and an edge, that one's worn off. Face and an edge. Everywhere there's an edge mark, we're running it through the spindle moulder because it's on the inside of the door and that's where the panels are. Kind of filming this a bit like a vlog because I haven't got an awful lot of time to be messing about prepping for camera shots and stuff. We'll start at 15 with this one with no spacers. So let's put a ring in the bed so we've got a bit more support. Raise that up. We start at 15. Let's put three mil into it and see what we end up with. See how close to 18 it is. We'll make the adjustment from there. This is where you want your pattern piece comes in handy again for making setup cuts and test cuts. Eighteen point three. Take half a mil on that. So I'll swap the one mil for half a mil's with the spacers. Seventeen point eight there, so we'll check that on the panel. Probably can't hear what I'm saying, but that's a pretty good fit. Pretty good. It's not too tight, but it's not uh, loose. Some bits it's a bit loose than others. So if we get any high spots or variation in the panel. Once we're checking them, we can just sand that down a touch, but that's a pretty good fit. It's just catching on some of the edges that are a bit rough in the saw, so 
I'm going to stick that set in and run everything through on them inside edges. Set the depth to 10mm. The depth setting is quite important. So if you weren't to quite make the 10mm, if you set that to 9 everywhere you've made a tenon with a 10mm setback and mortise to that position, if you're only grooving it back 9mm, your tenon is going to be 2mm oversized, so it's not going to go together. Equally, everything you go past what you've allowed for a setback, so if you went to 11mm deep groove, your door, if you wedge them rails up to the inside of the mortise, your door is going to be smaller than the amount you've gone over that groove. So one mil bottom rail, one mil top rail, your door is going to be two mil smaller than it should be. So it's pretty important to get this set up accurate to what you've set out in your mortises. There we have it, sports fans. That is the machine in the door. So all we've got left to do really is cut the porch room and the wedge room and the tenons, clean up all the edges of everything that we're going to be gluing together. So all these inside edges want sanding to get rid of planar ripples and line markings. I'm going to cut the panels to size with a bit of gap, so probably around 2mm gap from the tight size of the groove opening on all the panel components. I'll pre-coat them with a coat of paint or spray primer just to ease the sanding of them because you can sand them flat then with an orbital sander and it helps to to speed up the process basically. If you've got a panel and you're trying to sand into the corners, it's never quite as good as the sanding you get around the middle of the panel. So if you can do that before you put it together, it makes it a dead easy job. And then we we'll just glue it together. So if you look at the tenons for tonight, I don't think I'm gonna get much more done before I have to go home. You've probably seen how to do this on some of the other door videos. If this is the first video of mine that you're looking at then Please go and have a check out of the other videos. So we'll put these together as a pair. We're looking at the top rail here. So we can still see our markings out from when we set out that mortise position. I've just got the top rail. And we're looking to put that inside edge where it's got to go against that panel. We're going to push that line that we've just machined back with the groover against the front of that mortise like so so it's going to sit in that mortise nicely put it up to the inside edge here so that position there wants to be dead tight so that's what you're going to wedge the tenon against to reference a square position on your door and we're just going to mark this position here you can do this from measurements but I find it's a lot easier just to sit a tenon in and tick it quickly. So you want to come in from that line about a millimetre. So you just want a bit of clearance. You don't want to be above tight. So if tight would be fine, but it's best to have just a tiny bit of clearance. Now we've got a tick line of the width of that tenon. We can work out the depth. So we can use a caliper or a combination square. I like the combi square because you get a decent reference face off of the square and we can sit that in to the mortise bottom, push the rule down and just find the highest point in there until that square finds a high point. Lock it off and we can just run it along and check to make sure none of the haunch rooms 
are taller than that set in there. So you can do that for all your mortises, just double checking. It's a really easy way to mess up a door glue up is to cut your haunches too long and it prevents your shoulders from touching the door style and you get big gaps in your door. So if one of your mortiser settings has moved and they have raised up, using the combi square against that reference face is a good way to just double check that your glue up's gonna go okay. So once you've got that measurement, we're looking at uh, 41.2 mil, something like that on the measurement. That reference point is not from the end of the tenon, it's from the shoulder. So if we put, use our ruler against the shoulder and we mark in, I'm just gonna go a bit shy of 41 because it was just over 41. And then I make sure that the end of that square can't give me a measurement more than the haunch room can be, or the longest it can be, to prevent any of the door going together. So that gives me my max measurement. So everything I mark out now from this combi square is my wedge room. So if we go over to the vice, it makes it a bit easier to mark it up. My bench area is getting a bit chaotic. I've got some good plans for a nice bench and a, an area over here to, to work in for hand tools, but she's finding the time to achieve it at the minute. Hopefully over Christmas break, I can do a nice setup. Make a nice video of that. There you go, just using the square like that, gives us our two lines in the one tool and we just cut along them. I'm in a bit of a rush, you want a rip saw really. That's what I was taught to do. Always trying to mount everything so your cut is vertical. Makes it easier. Got more than one door to do. It's a lot quicker to do this on a bandsaw. So you just set up the fence on one piece to that tick line. And then set up a backstop so you can't go deeper than your haunch room and just run every piece through at once. But if you've just got the one door, it's a lot of different setups to make for all the different cuts and it's a bit of a, a bit of a waste of a time setting up a bandsaw for just one door. And there's no harm in using hand tools every now and then. I'd argue it's probably a bit, a bit quicker. Keep hold of these bits, we'll make the wedges out of them. That's that joint. That's what we've just cut. We've cleaned out the edges of the mortise. Fingers crossed, that should go together nicely. She's a little bit tight. It's gonna get a little bit of stuff coming out the mortise if you've not cleaned it through. Be aware of that before you start hammering it together. There we go. I'd say the fit of that joint is about perfect. Very nice. It's not quite square there. Look at that. Beautiful stuff. We'll look at the other side. Oh, it's good. If you'd cut the door style off at that Near the top of the top rail, you'll be able to check how tight the haunch setting in. But once you've set that combi square, I keep wanting to call it adjustable square, but that's just stupid. So it's not an adjustable square, is it? Once you've set that combi square up, you can't really go wrong as long as you're accurate with your marking out of it. I like to leave the horns on for that purpose there, you can knock your door apart quick using that bit of off cut that's gonna be wasted anyway. Don't get too carried away because if you start bashing away at that quite a lot, you are gonna see it in the top of that joint. 
It also gives you a nice little bit past the door that you can stick a clamp on so you, you, your clamp is not sat on the rail or if you're doing a clamp either side of the door it gives you room to put them both in line with the rail. So we'll just do the same process for all the other joints in the door. I'll run you through the bottom rail. The stub tenons are fairly simple, you just want to cut them off about 2mm short of the bottom of the tenon. It's the same process. So the process is the top rail. Remember this is a tenon, this is a haunch, this is a tenon, and this is a haunch. So tenon, we obviously want to leave the wood on. Haunch, we've got to cut it back to the depth of the haunch room. So for the tenon, we want that one mil space in. So it wants to be just, just shy of being tight. And then the, on this haunch room here, the middle one, this tenon line needs to be tight. So you want to be just, just tight. If you're gonna go anyway, take more off than less because if you take le less off here so this line you actually cut somewhere here it's going to draw that rail back and you're going to have a gap at this part of the door so if you're feeling like you're a bit inaccurate just cut slightly more off of the tenon but ideally that wants to be fairly tight and again on the back of that tenon we want one mil of wiggle room, which just allows us to get the door together and apart with a bit of ease. So we mark the other side while we're here. Um, that's a beautiful fit, that. Can you beat it? So it's a pretty quick process. When you're on it, you can rattle one of these out really quickly. Now pay real good attention when you get to cutting that you're leaving the tenons on your inside. It's a common mistake. I've done it several times. You got to this stage where you machined everything in the workshop. You tell your mate, yeah, I'm done with the tenoner. And he make, adjusts it for his job and makes, you know, starts his job. You come here and you'll mark that out wrong in a rush and you'll cut that bit off and that bit off and leave that one and that one as a tenon then you go to put it together and it's completely ruined because you've got no strength now in that door because you meant to cut that bit away and that bit away so really pay attention before you cut make sure that your inside edge is where your tenon is located and it works from there properly In the middle here, he's going to have to use a coping saw to hash that bit out. I like to see how quickly you can do that. Time! Keep them bits. So you can see how quick you can mark out the rail using this method make sure tenant is on the inside and you cut into the side of the material that you're taking away so you're leaving the tenon full on the line so this one's quicker Time. What's that quicker though? That was not a good move. Did I mention keep them bits? It should just slot together. Let it lovely like that. Okay. You push it up against this inside edge. You can see where our markings fall for what we've just done. Then we just push it together. It's going to be a little bit tight because it's a wide rail. That is absolutely perfect. 
What we're looking for after we've made them cuts is that our tenon sits nicely up against that inside edge just in here so that no gap and that rail is fully in this direction towards here and that means that the door will be the right size basically pretty flush across the front there that's nice there we go so I said before about the stub tenons just push them together so this is the longer muntin so I'll just push that together until it's tight and then measure the gap we've got Sixteen mil. I'll just cut eighteen mil off that tenon, and we should be good. There we go. Perfect. So we do that for all the stud tenons, so we know each one out of the door in its individual construction will fit together. Then we can try the door together as a one piece. Check each joint individually. We'll check the whole door as a as a one piece all together as that initial assembly to make sure that the tenon lengths of these work with the door and all the joints work together properly and it's the right size. Now there's a simple sort of easy way of assembling a door and there's many many hard ways where it just ends in beating the door up trying to get it together. Basically You've got two styles and they need to go together over parallel rails. So we'll assemble everything on the inside of the door first and then the styles go on last to encapsulate everything together. So depending on how complicated what you've got inside is, that needs to go together in its own order. Because we've got these muntins in the door, they need to go into the rails so the rails can sit parallel so that the door styles can go on. So we just put them together. This is easiest to do, lay flat on a bench like this, where everything supports it. So I'll just quickly assemble all of these. There's a top mark on this somewhere. Making sure you've got all face marks on the same side. And if you want to, once them muntins are all in the rails together, we can sit the style on and just use our marking out tick lines as a reference to make sure that nothing is vastly out. So they want to be pretty much spot on with our setting out lines. If they're not, we can make the adjustment now before we try and beat this style into place that's not going to fit. So once the middle is together, we'll put one style on and just one, not try and put both together. So you'll end up with each individual rail trying to find the path of least resistance. So this joint might be slightly looser than this one. So when you try to clamp it together, this bit goes in, but on this one here, that one might go in. So you end up twisting this munt in here and it just pinches everything on the door and makes your life a nightmare. So just put the one style on and get all of these seated against this style so it makes putting the other style on a really simple task. So you're just working each individual joint in as it gets to the door style. We just locate it in the mortise. You don't want to beat everything together or whack this too hard because if one of these rails is slightly misaligned or catches on one of the groove faces and then you hit it you're going to dent and damage that face so as, you, as each piece sort of approaches locating just be a bit gentle and make sure everything fits together nicely once it's all started to locate I stand the door up like this so that none of the crap on the workbench that might have fell out the joint is going to make any damage to them shoulders. 
and then we just seat them rails down together. Because we've got that one mill of wiggle room on each tenon, you've got that bit of play there to work with to loosen the stiction of the joint. If that was perfectly parallel in the hole, you'd, you've got no chance of putting it together. But because you've got that bit of wiggle room, you can do it one-handed and get that joint together, even though it's quite tight fit. The same applies with these middle joints. There's not as much wiggle room because you've got all the rails in the middle. They want to go down as parallel as you can together so that you don't dent any of these edges in the middle of the door. The bottom rail is always a bit stiffer than anything else because you've got a, a bigger surface area of joint. You might just need to play them. Don't hit the ends of the tenon too hard end up with a, a burr on them and then that makes it even harder to get the next style on. So you're just working that bottom rail so that everything's seated. Against that style and these munting rails are all nice and square. That is the top rail. And then it's just a really simple task of putting the other style on. This is normally where you find out that you've marked out two of the same styles and they won't go together. You've not done a pair. But if you start one end, so we're starting at the bottom here, you get it on at a bit of an angle, every joint then will hit in its own turn. So we just wiggle that one slightly to find the tenon, then we can tap it in place. And it's found this one here, so we just gently find where that one needs to go, tap it in place, and keep doing that for all the joints. Don't hit the door too hard with a mallet on the edges, unless it's massively oversized and you're going to trim it later if you want something just to tap it with. The second style is always a bit harder to put together because you're moving all the joints at once. at this stage, if everything's all right, we just give it a good check over, make sure all the joints are tight and that we've not got, if these rails are right hard up against the mortise positions here and here, and there's a gap in this rail, we've got to adjust it so that they can meet this rail. Either get a longer piece in this uh, munting, get a longer, longer munting out so that it meets those rails, or we need to Trim a bit off the tenon so it can all move up a, a tiny bit and then tighten that joint up. Equally, if it's too long, you need to go back to the tenon and make an adjustment. But you, you are quite limited if you've got a mould or a profile on the door. You can't really go back on the tenon after you've machined the mouldings on these rails. So this is where you're setting out. It's got to be really accurate. But this door looks all right, so now it's together we'll just take the panel gap measurements and cut the panels out. I'm going to leave this for tonight so I'll pick that up next time I'm in the workshop. So now I've dry assembled the door I'm just going to check each panel on them internal measurements and then add on the depth of the groove less a couple of mil to give the panel a bit of gap and then I can cut all my panels out to fill these spaces in. So for example, that one there, 208, 208. So we've got a 10 mil deep groove, 208. I'll add on the 20 mil, which is uh, 228. Then I'll knock off two mil from that. So 226 is the width of all these half width panels. So these four, 
And then the height of that one will be 256 plus that 18 mil. So the two 10 mil groove depths less that two mil for a bit of a gap. And I'll cut all of them out of my 18 mil panel material. Give them a quick sand with 120 grit and I'm going to pre-paint these before I glue the door together. I like to take quite a decent chamfer off the edges or an aris so that when you're knocking the door together as a final glue up it doesn't catch a sharp edge and ruin that really nice clean line between panel and door. So if you get a nice chamfer on there it just helps ease everything together. While we wait for the paint to dry on the panels, I'm just going to cut the wedges out of the block so we cut off the tenons. So we can measure the gap that's left in the door now that it's together. What about 8 to 10 mil gaps in there? So we want to make sure the fattest end of the wedge is at least 10 mil thick. I really ought to make myself a better wedge jig. I've had this one for years now, it's almost like a lot of furniture. Another thing we can do while we're waiting for the panels to dry with that paint is just sand the, all the inside edges so there's no planar ripples or saw marks or anything on them nice in well, the difficult to reach and difficult to sand inside edges before we glue it together. Normally I use a pad like this, a flat backing pad with some 150 grit or 100 grit paper in it and just work it in by hand. And all that allows you to do is keep it perfectly flat across this way and uh, perfectly smooth along the face or the edge of the door so that where the joints are you're not rounding a corner off whereas if you use something like an orbital sander you tend to get a rounding effect on these edges and that will show in the joint so something like this will keep it nice and flat. Right, so the door's all ready to glue together. I've just pushed it together with the panels in just to check everything's a good fit and there's not going to be any problems while we glue it up. I'm going to have to work like a scolded cat on this one because I've only got PU glue to glue it up with. I've run out of runny glue. I normally use something like a Type Bond 2 or a Type Bond 3 that's runny glue. It's going to give you a bit more of an open time before it sets, whereas the PU glues tend to set in about five to ten minutes depending on what variety you're using. So yeah, it's going to be a fun game with all these joints to, to get the adhesive on before it sets and actually get the thing together. So I'm not going to talk too much, I'm just going to crack on with it.
mask on. Yes. And I can then but Seriously, not fun. So, hindsight from that glue up. PU glue is alright for gluing a door up, as long as it's got no moisture in it, like a coir. I think the uh, because it's tulip wood and it's probably got a higher ambient moisture than a coir. That was a b <sighs> The only thing I can put it down to, because the PU glue is moisture cure and it sets a bit quicker with that higher moisture content. So, in a coir that door would have gone alright. But that glue was pretty much nearly dry as I was putting that last style on. It still had a bit of mallee to it, so there's still wet glue in there, but uh, about as close as you're going to get to not getting the door style on. So it's still sticky on the stick there, so I think it'll affect the strength of the door. That was just really hard work. A new addition to the workshop look. Unfortunately it's not a new machine, it's this pain in the bum. But anyway, hopefully you've seen how to make the door and I've explained it well enough that if you've got some kit you could go and make your own version of this. It's the same principle for any type of panel door where the panel's encapsulated within a groove. So slightly different process if you're beading the panels in but any shape or sort of amount of rails and styles and panels that you want in a door, it's all on the same principle of what we've been through with this one. What do you think to it, Otis? What, what do you think? What do you think to the door? You're not bothered, are you? You're not interested. You're not going to subscribe, are you, mate? Yeah. What's this? What's this? What do you think? You want scraps, don't you? There's plenty of them on the floor. <laughs> <laughs>